Hello there, friends. Welcome to this edition of Mind If I Speak. I'm Dr. Tim Stoffer, and today's conversation is with a pastor, a medical doctor, and a journalist as we talk about the truth related to COVID-19. Thanks for joining me. If you like this channel, please subscribe below and share it with your friends. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm here with three of my friends who happen to have three different professions, a doctor, Dorvin Byler, a journalist, Andrew Sharp, and a professional counselor, Tim Stauffer. And I'm hoping that you've tuned in this evening because you're ready to think thoughtfully about what's happening in our country right now with COVID-19. And I hope you've joined because you've heard different perspectives. I hope you've heard some tense moments and seen some tense things said, and that you're here tonight to think, how do we communicate about what's happening with compassion? That's, that's my hope as a pastor and as a mediator. As a mediator, I, I was actually hoping that tonight my wife and I would be doing a conflict resolution workshop for couples, but that event got canceled due to COVID-19. And it struck me whenever it popped up on my calendar earlier today that in a way, I hope my perspective on this is, I hope we can hear what's actually happening within professions and disciplines and understand the values in those fields and also understand how it's impacting people when the news comes across, why there's such tension and disagreement. In a way, I think our nation needs a mediation session so that we can hear each other and understand where we're coming from. So that's a little about myself. And I just invite Tim, why don't you introduce yourself and then Dorvin and Andrew, give us a little bit about what you do, why you decided to do what you do and why you consented to join this discussion this evening. Yes, well, thanks Preston for um, hosting. My name's um, Tim Stauffer. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor, um, have a private practice in, in Dublin, Ohio. Um, good friends with Preston for quite, for quite some time. Um, this is a really challenging time and space for a lot of people, a lot of grief, a lot of loss, a lot of anger. Um, there's also an opportunity for unity and connection with neighbors and, and rebuilding um, some of our priority structures. Um, and so I was honored to be invited to join this conversation and look forward to um, having, a, having a fun conversation tonight. So thanks for joining us. I am uh, Dorvin Byler. I'm a newly minted physician, as in one week ago. I graduated um, from Ohio University's campus here in Dublin, Ohio. I live in Columbus um, as well, and I will be starting in June as a family medicine resident at the Dublin Methodist Hospital. Um, so I, I do not have clinical experience very much of it yet. Um, uh, and I am home right now uh, with many of you uh, just watching what's happening and, and reading as much as I can. Um, about what's happening. Uh, I'm really, I love medicine be mostly because I really enjoy trying to help patients understand their medical problems so that they can better take care of themselves. That's what draws me to primary care medicine. Um, and, and that's what makes me interested in a conversation like this, because I'm hoping that I can offer something that helps you understand a little more carefully what's happening with this virus so you can um, make better decisions about about how you want to react to it as well. Well, I'm Andrew Sharp. I am a journalist in Wilmington, Delaware. I, um, I guess this is an Ohio-centric audience, so I should say Delaware <laughs> is a state, not the town <laughs> north of Columbus. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a paper there. It's the, the largest paper in Delaware. Um, so I'm an editor. I'm in charge of policing the grammar, um, kind of the last line of defense to make sure the facts are correct before it goes out, and then taking those stories and getting them out to the public as best we can on social media. And um, so uh, interacting with readers is a good part of my job, too, as well. So what drew me to journalism, I was on my way to 
a career as a successful and famous magazine writer and I kind of stumbled into newspaper work on the way and I found out I loved it. I just love digging for truth. I love wrestling with some of these hard issues and I, it just feels so important to tell people's stories, to tell, to tell what's going on. Um, obviously in a time like this, we can see the importance of that. Um, and to kind of try to see through the baloney um, from people with an agenda is another um, fun angle that I, mm -hmm. my per suits my personality well, I think so. Bet it does, Andrew, and your friends would, friends would say amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> At least this friend would. Yeah. Like I told you guys earlier, I'm just excited that we get a chance to talk this evening and everyone else that, maybe he's a friend on Facebook who's joining in. We're glad you can do that. And feel free to leave a comment, a like, a share to let others know this conversation's happening because we're, we're going to get a broader perspective on the experience of what we're going through from different professions, different experiences. So as a pastor, I, I have people in my congregation who hear different things in the news and believe different sets of data when it comes to the medical side and are experiencing a lot of different emotions on the human experience side of what we're going through. So in the middle of all this, my hope is that as we go through tonight, we'll, we'll gain some clarity and we'll gain some compassion for others. So to start us off, Dorvin, I think the question on everybody's mind is what is the truth about COVID-19? What, what does the data say? We have this projection, there's this, number like 2.2 million people are going to die and then there's 200,000, 160,000 and this debate that's framed and when I first heard about it I I told somebody look there's going to be 10 funerals at our church if COVID-19 gets here the first Sunday we canceled because I heard of a 3.4 percent death rate it's like this is the Spanish flu and now it's like I've heard other people say this is the flu and so just talk to us about the medical field as a student and a recently minted doctor what is what is the research that you have at your disposal talk to us about the insights that you've um, actually you've been gaining i guess as you study this yeah um if i if i communicate one thing i hope that uh, you hear me say that the data we have is is really poor um and and that is what has led to these varying predictions, um, as well as some of the actions we've taken. Um, but I, I hope to explain to you a, a little bit of how some of these things are calculated, like the death rate, et cetera, um, and what kind of variables are here that are keeping us from having a really good grasp on what this virus is. Um, first, I'll just start with this. There's, it's very clear that this virus is deadly to some degree, based on purely the body counts that we have at our disposal. Those are really, I don't know why any government would fake the amount of deaths that they have in their country. Um, and if you just look at the deaths over the past month throughout the world, um, there has been a huge increase from what there would be on average every year. Um, we're at 200,000 deaths attributed to COVID. Um, but if you look at countries um, throughout the world, you can see that there, the death counts in those countries is actually even higher than that in some cases. For example, New York City it, over the past five years averaged about 6,000 deaths in the March 11 to April 22nd time period. Um, but this year they had 25,000 deaths. So that's an excess of 19,000, even though they reported 15,000 COVID deaths, right? So we're missing 4,000 deaths for some reason. Seems most likely that they are also COVID deaths that happen. Um, without people getting to the hospital or getting tested. Because um, we don't have very many people getting tested, right? So that's the biggest complication. So I'll talk now about what a death rate is, right? So the death rate is kind of a layman's term for kind of two sets of data. One is the, the case fatality rate, which is everybody who tested positive for COVID and then died. Um, there's also the infection fatality rate, which is people who we know died from COVID. And you can see how that would be harder to get to than just the case fatality rate. 
And in fact, we will definitely not know that for sure until after this pandemic is passed. Um, and even then it'll still be a little shaky. Um, to get to the case fatality rate, you're just taking all the people who died with a positive COVID test and dividing it by all the people who had a positive COVID test, right? So in the US right now, that is about 50,000 divided by a million. And so we get 5% right now for, for the US. That's not quite accurate because the majority of those million cases are still not finished with the disease. So some of them might die yet, right? And that would increase um, the, the case fatality rate. But it's also not accurate because we know there's way more people than a million who have COVID right now, right? We just can't test them all because we don't have enough tests. Um, so the, den the denominator should be way larger. Um, there are studies trying to test antibodies in people's blood right now, um, some really well done and others not so well done. Um, and they're finding that there's lots of people with antibodies, um, some of them indicating that COVID is possibly up to 15 times more widespread than our testing number shows right now. Um, if we use that data, which like I just said, is not certain yet, um, then the case fatality rate looks likely to drop just under 1%. So from 5% right now that we have to just under 1%, which means if 100 people got COVID, likely one person would die, right? We also know that young people are almost never dying from this. You hear in the news of some younger people dying, but on if you take all of the numbers, it's really low under 30. Mm -hmm. um, if you're under 30, the case fatality rate for you is probably under 0.1%, I would say. If you're over 70, however, case fatality rate goes way up it might actually be 3%, it might actually be 5%, it's hard to tell. So just for comparison, the, the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic had an infection fatality rate, not case, of 2.6%, best we can estimate. Um, and the seasonal flu, the rate typically for the infection fatality rate is around 0.1%. Um, any questions or thoughts on, on what I gave there so far? I wanna talk more about these tests we've been using and how good they are, but just on what I've offered so far, do you guys have any thoughts or questions? Dorvan, do you, can you speak at all? Something I've been hearing recently is that younger people have been having strokes. Is that accurate? Maybe. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> so here's, uh, I'll repeat this again. We're doing science right now in one week that should be taking a year, right? And people are writing articles like the ones that were cited in these, in these articles you were reading that normally would be peer reviewed and then published in a journal in a process of six months to a year. And they're just posting drafts online and saying, hey, we found this thing out about COVID, it's causing strokes. And so, and then all the news article, news companies are posting those in articles. So my answer is maybe, um, yeah, there was, some com there was some compelling evidence in the studies that were showing that there could be younger people who are suffering strokes, usually because clotting is happening for some reason because of this virus. Um, that seemed like, oh, that could be interesting. But again, we don't really know that yet, right? In, in a month, there might be new, a new study showing that's wrong. And then everyone will say, see, the doctors were lying to us. <laughs> but it's not the case. The, the doctors are, th we're throwing out facts right now because this is an emergency. We're, we're putting out research as fast as we can because we're trying to help out. Um, but, and sometimes we're going to be wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's my thought on that. Mm -hmm. So the, the tests that we're using, we haven't had enough of them because we've been missing some of the chemicals. Here in Ohio, especially, we've been missing the reagents. Um, and we, the reason we couldn't get more of it is because it was an international supply chain. And guess what? Every other country in the world wants these tests right now too. So we were having a really hard time getting it. Governor DeWine just announced that we're producing it in Ohio now, which is really great. So we should have more of the tests. But even if we did have enough of that test, the, the swab that they stick up your nose and back to your sinuses back there, um, th there are varying estimates of how sensitive that is, right? Some of the estimates had it as low as 70%, which is pretty bad, which means if we tested 10 people who had COVID, seven of them, the test would say were positive and three would say they were negative, even though they were positive. And then if we later did like a bronchoscopy and went down in their lungs and pulled out some fluid from there and tested it, it would show that they did actually have COVID. 
So that's a little scary. And then on the other hand, these antibody tests that you're going to be reading about all the time. Um, uh, Governor Cuomo was talking about it today in New York. They're starting all these antibody tests because um, we're going to use those to kind of estimate how much infection there is in the population. The problem with some of those is that they've had a really low specificity, which is how they have a high rate of false positives. So for example, if they tested 10 people, um, they would get one extra positive, one false positive out of the, mm -hmm. that group. And that doesn't seem like very much, but when you're testing 5,000 people and you get an extra 50 positives, that is gonna increase the infection rate by a lot when you extrapolate that out. It's gonna really change a lot of how we look at how deadly this virus is. I'm throwing all of these things out there to say, um, all of the data we're getting should be used with caution, right? And, and I think it's been hard for people to wrap their minds around that. And some of the media reports have not presented it in a cautious way to say, we have these tests and we have this model, which suggests this might be what's gonna happen. Instead, they said, 1 million are gonna die. And then later people feel lied to because that didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm arguing that the problem was at the start, the data wasn't presented in a tentative enough way. Um, so I encourage all of you when you're reading news articles, if you read a news article that talks about a study and they present one number and say, this is what it is, they aren't doing their job quite right. They should instead say, this study produced these, this range of numbers, especially when we're looking at these antibody tests, because it's easy to calculate. You can give a kind of range and then, or like this much confidence that this is true, right? There should be some caveats being presented to you. Jorvin, this is, the, you just you just nailed it, man. Thank you for that <laughs> humility. And I can just imagine uh, the average person sitting down to read a medical article, like peer reviewed, professional in depth. And I imagine they would read about three sentences and then they put it down <laughs> and they would say, just tell me the facts, just tell me what I need to know. And they would want to read the news, which tells them something confidently. But Andrew, you're a journalist. Talk to us about reporting. I mean, there's the doctors, they're working with data that's not perfect. And we have a very humble doctor with this to say that. But when you guys as journalists get data, what is what makes a good news story? How do you go about writing with what you have to work with? Well, I, I don't know if you're asking me to be humble, that's going to be difficult. Maybe. I'm not <laughs> <to see you. laughs> um, you know, I think I, I, it is a challenge and I think sometimes that's where we run into accuracy issues is that we're, we're also in a rush, you know, we've got a day, we've got an hour to write a story and that's a lot to plow through. And um, a lot of newspapers have health reporters who have a lot of deep medical knowledge, but some don't. And so um, you're gonna see different levels of quality as far as what they're able to process and put out. And then, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that's a fair point that sometimes we will take stuff and say, this is, this is what it is and we're not quite understanding um, the issue part of, you know, I think that's kind of one of the most annoying news trends maybe is the studies show that you should stop drinking coffee. Studies show that you should start drinking coffee. Um, we all know do. the truth is you should keep drinking coffee. Yes, <laughs> but the, but, but the truth is we still don't know. And the studies are all over the place because we don't know. And so, and so, in the search for a story, we can seize on a study. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that is done out of an effort to deceive. I think it's an effort to understand mm -hmm. and um, some of the nuance is lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and right now, there are researchers all around the world who have stopped their research on whatever else they were doing. And they're studying COVID, right? And all of them are coming up with new things to throw out, right? And they're trying to do it as fast as they can, either because they're, on mo I think mostly because they're trying to be helpful, right? And, but uh, like I just said, these studies aren't going through the normal peer review process. So now it's even more dangerous than it would have been last year 
for a reporter to grab a study that it hasn't been reviewed and shot down by editors of a medical journal, right? And just pull facts out of it. Um, and if you aren't able to read it with a really critical eye and understand like all the specificity and you know, how good this test is, it can be really hard to see the reality. So Tim, hearing that, I'm a pastor, right? I just need to know what the right decision is to do for my church. When is it safe to meet again? When is it safe to get back to life as normal? So I, I, as a human being, I want some kind of certainty and hearing a doctor talk about there's a lot we don't know and hearing a journalist say, it's not, uh, it's not actually an easy thing to find good data and present it in a way. I mean, I just want the facts. So Andrew, I'm gonna come back to you, but Tim, why do I want the facts like that? And is that a common human emotion when we're going through something like this from a clinical perspective? For sure. I think like, um, I was having a conversation just the other day um, with someone uh, and they were describing just the incredible amount of loss that they've experienced, um, especially because of the economic shutdown um, where all of a sudden orders are coming in from the state of cease and desist. Um, and all of a sudden, um, this person summarized it as everything that I worked for in my life is being jeopardized through one event. And that is really, really tough for me to stomach mm -hmm. and to wrap my head around and navigate. And so I think like, as I'm, as I'm listening to, um, uh, as I was listening to Dorvin talking, I was like, this kind of like humility and uncertainty, many people hackles get raised quickly. Like how dare we shut down an entire culture and society and, and bring the hit the brakes and screech a global economy to a halt and have tremendous, uh, tremendous inconvenience and much deeper than inconvenience, absolute loss um, that's going to ripple effect probably for the next number of years, if not decade. Uh, and so I think like psychologically, emotionally for people, that is devastating. It's a devastating trauma to endure, to see their life's work um, kind of crumbling with no fault of their own. Nothing, nothing's happening. And so any kind of tentativeness or inaccuracy of the data is, is frightening to people. Um, and I think it actually steers a lot of people um, towards conspiratorial um, kind of thinking. And so um, people, when people lose a sense of control in life, they're much more likely to embrace conspiratorial ideas. Uh, one of the, what's interesting is one of the greatest predictors of, a, of if someone will believe a particular conspiracy theory is their political orientation. Um, and so, uh, and that, that's not about one party or the other, but it's like, if one, if one, if whoever's in power, if you prefer the ideas of the people who are not in power, will tend to see everything through a conspiratorial lens. Uh, and so, so right now you have a lot of people asking questions of like, are this, is this about really powerful people? taking over in some malicious and malevolent way. Um, and that is a common strategy psychologically for people to cope with being out of control. Um, so when someone doesn't have a sense of control, um, if they can say they have special insight or knowledge um, into the events that are happening and they can explain it, even if they don't have control, they at least have the power of explanation. Um, and that can bring a sense of psychological well-being to people. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of that kind of process happening where, where it's like, it's clear, the, the data is clear that COVID is incredibly contagious. Um, we don't even know exactly how it spreads. Um, um, just as a personal aside, my, both of my parents tested positive um, for COVID-19. My dad was in the hospital for numbers of days. It's a brutal, it's a brutal virus. And, um, 
And I was wondering, like, is it the end of the line? Am I going to be even able to travel to another state potentially for a funeral? And so it's like it became it became incredibly real. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh my word, this is this is a real thing, and it is severe, um, and and it needs to be taken really, really seriously. At the same time, I have people sit in my office, or I have people talking about. You know what? My whole, my entire livelihood's in jeopardy. Hey Tim, I can't, I can't come, I can't come in for appointments anymore until this crisis is over because I don't know if I'm going to have a job. Uh, and so the mental health, we're going to see the cement block fell into the pond, um, the ripple effects, and how it's going to impact the mental health of our of our communities and our culture are still yet to be discovered and seen. Um, and in many regards. The researchers in the social science are just really um, gearing up and starting to gather data for understanding the psychological impact. But it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be acute and it's going to be severe. Um, and we're going to see, um, we're going to see people. Just one of my colleagues the other day told me someone called him and was suicidal because he said, "I, everything that I have, I've lost." I've lost my entire portfolio. I'm I'm done. I'm it's over. And and um, so it's it's a severe it's a severe crisis um, on the mental health side. Um, and that's where I think we have to have a great deal of humility and uh, in the the tough decisions that the governors are making and the um, and the federal government is making. Um, this is hard. This is hard place. And I think particularly for believers, this is an opportunity for us. Um, to, as the little song says, little kid song says, let your little light shine. It's like we have an opportunity um, to have a different voice and a different presence within our culture that can bring about a sense of peace um, for people. Um, but sadly, um, with especially within some of the news stories I've been seeing, is there's a contingency of pastors who refuse to honor the guidance of their states and decide they're going to drive a stake in the ground of defiance, uh, which I think is sad, but it speaks to, it speaks to the psychological impact of feeling out of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, I have a pastor friend who we go back and forth on that. And it's a, you know, his perception is this is an attack on religious liberty in some way. And where would you, his question to me was, where would you, uh, where would you stand up? Like if the government would shut down for the flu season annually for several months out of the year, would you, would you then not, would you then not go meet in church? And uh, <laughs> that's where the data Dorvin becomes so important of like, this is not the flu. This might, this might not be the Spanish flu. The jury's still out on that range, but this is not the flu. And then Andrew, it kind of comes back to, uh, to your role as a journalist, we had a comment uh, from a friend of mine who's not always thrilled about media. I'm guessing from his comment here, he says, primary concern is getting ratings and, and that they finally, they find that by fear, like fear and ratings and political agendas that skew real facts, which is a good segue actually into our next question because when my brother became a referee I started standing up for referees at games <laughs> because his first night as a ref, you know, he had a, a coach of a Christian team yelling at him. And the coach said like, what is this your first game? <laughs> and my brother wanted to look at him and say, yeah, actually it is, but you, you can't do that as a referee. And that's kind of how I feel when I hear people knocking journalists, Andrew, and dismissing things as like, a whole batch of journalists is mainstream. I, I think of you and I think of the work you do as a journalist and I just think that's not fair. Like, that's not fair to my, to my friend Andrew. So talk to us about facts. What's the difference between facts and news? How can I like the tone you're taking that it's not fair. Um, that, that makes me feel good. Um, <laughs> so just to address the, the comment that you had um, from your friend, you know, it would be a dumb play right now for media companies to be hyping this up um, 
into something that it's not and just to keep on hyping because the news industry is being hit very hard by this. In the best of times, we're facing some real challenges with revenue now. Um, staffs have been shrinking. This isn't a growing economy. Staffs have been shrinking and um, we've been really casting around trying to figure out how are we going to make this business model work. And now this advertising has dropped a lot and um, it's going to wipe out some small town papers and it's really hurting bigger papers too. Um, journalists are being laid off and um, put on furlough. I've been put on furlough already, um, unpaid furlough. And so I think, I think what I would want people to know is that the reporters that I know in our newsroom and from what I can tell the people I'm seeing around the country, um, the people I interact with really believe in what we're reporting on this. Um, and we're trying to report accurately. We want to give people the facts. And if, if my coworkers were being asked to promote a suicidal line in order to prop up ratings for the media companies, I think there would be a lot of bitterness about that and, and protest and outrage. And you guys would be hearing about it because journalists are good at getting their opinions out. Um, and that's not happening. My, you know, we certainly have people who are upset about the uncertainties they're facing and, and under a great deal of stress for their jobs, but they are really throwing themselves into this COVID coverage um, in a way that I am really impressed by. Um, as far as talking about how to, how to report the facts, I'll, I'll take a step back from COVID-19 and talk about just coverage in general, because I think there's a huge misperception um, in general about media coverage. You know, people want it to be black and white, either the media has this conspiracy where they're out to promote a false agenda and take down one side and prop up the other side, or they are saints and they always get it right. And um, they're just darn near perfect. And the fact is, you know, we're all human. Um, we're, we're in an industry where there's a lot of different kinds of media. Um, so if you would say something like this is the mainstream media, I would say, what media? Um, are you talking about cable news? Are you talking about a small town newspaper? Are you talking about a large town newspaper? Are you talking about the local TV news? Um, are you talking about Rush Limbaugh who reaches a lot of people? That's media. So it's just, it's just inaccurate to sit, take, to say the media. Um, that's just not accurate. Um, so when we look at, at facts, we, we do more than the facts. You can list facts. It's going to be dry. It's going to be like an Excel spreadsheet. Fact one, so-and-so went here. They did this. They said that. And, the, and also, it's not necessarily going to be accurate because if you report what somebody said and what somebody said isn't accurate, um, you have pushed that out there. Um, so I think what we try to do is provide context. Um, and I want to clear up the myth a little bit of unbiased. Everybody has a bias. Everybody has a, a way they see the world. And so when journalists are picking which facts are important to include in a story, you know, that's going to d differ from reporter to reporter. Edit uh, the uh, reporter will tell you that, that their editor sees it differently than they do. Um, and it's impossible to tell a story without any slant at all, because that's how we tell stories. We're putting it in context. And so you have to try your best to be fair, tell the truth, be accurate, um, and not to veer into opinion, but it's an incredibly fine line to walk and um, nobody does it perfectly. And so 
Um, you know, we used to have party papers, Republican and Democrat um, or Whig or way back um, Democratic Republican. Um, and they were just vitriol. They would go at each other all the time. They would um, historically, you know, journalism did not have as good of a reputation and rightfully so in some cases. Um, the ironic thing about the criticism of the media right now is that probably in the last 50 years, the standards are higher than they've ever been. Um, people are holding themselves to a much higher standard now um, than even, you know, 75 to 100 years ago, a paper would have said, you know what, we're on the side of the government. We are, we are on the side of our advertisers and, and we're gonna put out a line that's um, consistent with that. Now that, it, that didn't mean they would lie about the news, but they didn't care as much about slant. And what you saw a little bit is, first off the Associated Press wanted to sell stories to both sides. Um, so they had to shoot down the middle and that kind of got a tradition started where people liked that kind of news where it wasn't so much slant. And so um, they kind of pioneered that and it's, it's a tradition that has only grown. Um, a, a major catalyst for that was Vietnam um, and, and Watergate where journalists and newspapers in general said, wait a minute, we can't just prop up the official line. Um, we need to dig deeper here. We need to hold people accountable. And so how, how we do that, um, yeah, it's not perfect. Um, ironically, I think the more slanted the news coverage is, the more people like it, if it, if it aligns with, so if, if you're gonna trust a news source, if it's slanted toward you, you're gonna, you're gonna trust it more. Mm. Um, so. There, now, now we're getting to the good stuff because, <laughs> because you said, like you said, like if you look at journalism, the history of it, never, it's, it, it's, it's holding itself to a higher stream today than ever before. It's, it's each reporter's biases, interpretation will be written to give context but then you're saying that some of those biases or contexts will just align better with some readers and others and they'll be drawn into that. And is that why people call something the mainstream media? Because something about mainstream does not align with their biases. And then on the other side, I don't know, I've heard the expression mainstream. What do you, what do you think that is? What do you think that means the term? And I'll let the doctor or the counselor weigh in on this too, because maybe this is not just a journalist question. This might be a human psychology question. But what is mainstream? Well, I've never heard Rush Limbaugh included in mainstream. <laughs> I didn't include him in the mainstream. I included him in media. Um, but he is, in a way, very mainstream because he reaches a huge audience. And so does Breitbart. And so does um, Michael Moore. And so does Bill Maher and all these people who have a clear agenda um you know I, I think what i'm a little bemused sometimes when people take us to task um and by us i guess i mean our paper specifically but journalism in general they'll take us to task for minor nitpicky details in a story right so this was slightly wrong that was slightly wrong. You left out this. I didn't like the way you focused the story. And that's, that's a different thing than having an agenda. That's, that's quibbling over how it was presented. And then those same people then embrace people who clearly have an agenda, who are politicians, who have every reason to present what they're saying in a um, twisted or slanted light, and they accept that as being truth with, without um, much questioning. And, and I, I think it's fairly clear that politicians on both sides are out to spin, have, a, have every motive in the world to spin the news to, to fit. So if you're trusting a party spokesman, 
um, over someone and your reasoning is that you didn't like the way that journalist framed it, so that, so they're biased. Um, yeah, that takes, I'm a little taken aback by that. I, you know, I, that, that, that's where people see the slant that fits their viewpoint and they're comfortable with that. It makes sense to them and they embrace it. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question completely. Yeah, I mean, and that the aligning of that, I think, leads to polarization and leads to people not hearing each other or trying to understand each other. And so that's where we see what I would call as a crisis in compassion. We have a lack of trying to even understand each other. Well, and I, I, I would make a quick point, too, about mainstream. I think I think there is a certain segment of the news that takes it very seriously, that they want to be accurate and that they are at least trying to be fair. Um, and I would kind of, I would call that mainstream. So if you're a talk radio host, you're not, you're not a journalist in the sense that you're not trying to be fair. You have something you want to present and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. You have a worldview and you're presenting it. Preachers do the same thing. Um, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to lump into the mainstream kind of those those news organizations that are that are trying very hard to be fair and look at both sides. Yeah, that makes. I had to, I had to think while well, while you were talking about um, people. First of all, that the facts need to be framed in something, and I was just thinking about um, preaching sermons. Right, it's it's sort of the same thing when a preacher gets up and delivers a sermon. You could just read the passage and that would be it, right? But no, we expect the pastor to read the passage and then present like his interpretation of this text and how it applies to us. And, you know, some of those things, it's sort of the same concept. And then another thought I had was, um, well, first of all, just thinking about journalists not benefiting from this current crisis. Um, doctors are not benefiting from this current crisis. There is so much money being lost right now across the country from every single outpatient physician, which is the majority, right? Who cannot have do procedures in the office that aren't um, aren't uh, medically necessary right now. So, you know, a dermatologist who is making five hundred grand a year last year, this year is not making that because all of the skin biopsies, all of that stuff, is being delayed, um, and even the the inpatient, um, like the, all of the hospitals right now, so all of Ohio Health here in Columbus, like they're not making money at all because all of their elective surgeries are postponed and they had to clear out space and make more ICU rooms. And, and now they're sitting here waiting for this COVID surge, right? Like there's no motivation from the medical community to propagate this either, right? If they didn't believe this was real, um, it would be much to their benefit to be like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, come on back in, we need your income um, let's deal with other medical things, right? And as a family doctor, there's a lot of people getting off the hook from their colonoscopies right now, right? And that's not okay. <laughs> so we want this to be over as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Let's keep this going. <laughs> <laughs> the counseling is seeing an uptick in need. Well, yeah, well, that's I think, true. I think Tim, like I what you... wondering about confirmation bias while Andrew was talking. What is yeah. what is that? Yeah, confirmation bias is a, a, a fascinating psychological phenomena um, where two different people can hear the exact same um, data or the same information and draw radically different conclusions from it. Um, and the conclusions that they typically will draw will be what supports their original ideas. Uh, and so that's that's problematic especially when people are really at odds with each other because the same information will drive people further apart rather than bringing them together and so so it's like even even good solid research anybody who has any history and statistics um, will make the case that you can kind of make statistics and bend them to say whatever you wish for them to say uh, and and that's frightening um, and there are certainly, there will certainly be no shortage of evidence that people have twisted things to their own advantage. Um, and it's not just the politicians that do that. I mean, it's like, that's a, that's a human phenomena that we, we tend. And right now we are so polarized 
as a culture that we are using confirmation bias to drive us further and deeper into our own echo chambers. And so even places like Facebook, et cetera, um, um, have echo chambers where our friends and whoever is in our friend group will tend to um, say the similar things and then the algorithms will continue to pump the same stories to people to reinforce what they're thinking and further polarizing us. Uh, and so we get further entrenched in our own in our own ideas. And even worse, we become afraid of anybody who's different than us or anybody who holds a different perspective and we see them through a conspiratorial lens. And so when, right now, okay, so the hospitals aren't profiting from this. So why would they cooperate with the conspiracy? Well, they could, cons they could cooperate with the conspiracy because they're gonna get paid off later after, after the big bad monster takes over the entire culture they'll get they'll get a kickback for it uh, and so the naysayers always win like the naysayers never get proved wrong the conspiracy theorists always just have another layer upon which well that's just part of the conspiracy that's part of how they're masking the whole the whole thing and so the the more you argue with the conspiracy theorists the more you begin the stronger the conspiracy theorists ideas, the more likely you're dealing with a personality disordered person. Like you're, you're likely going to have a person that has schizotypal factors or have some sort of really eccentric ideas that are much more in the pathological place. Now we're all susceptible to it to some degree. In fact, research shows us that most of us believe something that could be called a conspiracy theory in other words, it's not rooted in, in absolute verifiable data, and we still, we still all believe it. Many Christians um, would get lumped into that by just simply believing that Jesus was the Son of God. Well, that's kind of eccentric. That's pretty bizarre. And yet millions of people around the globe believe it. And some people would say, oh, that's, that's evidence of a conspiracy theory. Uh, and so... <laughs> That's the best, truest conspiracy theory to ever hit the planet. It, um, I, think, I, I think so. Um, but, um, but so confirmation bias pushes us into our camps. There's another psychological phenomenon called the fundamental attribution error. Um, and the fundamental attribution error um, is pernicious because what it, what it says is that we will tend to attribute malevolent um, I, we, we tend to say other people are being malevolent and evil or they have dark, um, dark motives, but not me. Like I have, like I don't, won't attribute anything bad to myself, but I will attribute to other people um, all of those qualities. And so confirmation bias and the fundamental attribution error just push us further and further apart. Uh, and now if you're on the opposite side, you are a danger to me. Um, and so, so, I mean, I've been seeing things on Facebook posts that, that if you have an opinion about opening up our economies, well, you just simply don't care about people and you want them to die. Um, and don't you care about my child who has a compromised immune system or is a high risk? Don't you care about, about the people who could get sick? And it's like, well, the people who want to, keep the quarantine going longer to be safer. Don't you care about the people who are going to commit suicide and are losing their livelihoods? And so we attribute and we have confirmation bias and it presses us apart and then we'll turn and shoot at each other. And, and that's a, I think that's one of the most pernicious things that's been happening. Well, it's probably been happening forever, but the past, um, the past couple political cycles, it's been just ramping up, um, at least from my perspective and getting more and more intense, where if you disagree uh, with one another, if you voted for Trump or if you voted for um, Hillary or if you voted this way or that way, you're my enemy or you're somehow, um, you're, there's something fundamentally wrong with you. Uh, and so we get further and further into our camps. Mm. Um, and I think it's scary and that's as frightening to me culturally and, um, and, and psychologically and mental health as much as it is medically.
Yeah. I think the other, the other big component uh, related to fear is, and this would come back to, I think a pastor could address this as well as anyone, is, is that we don't know how to deal with death anymore. Like death is, we're not able to control death in the medical community. Um, we're seeing the cracks in the, that the medical community is not able to just absolutely protect us and keep us healthy. Um, and in many ways, I think many people are disappointed that what they always felt was, well, the scientists and the medical doctors can figure it out and save us from these things. Well, not so much. Um, and we have to deal with our fear of death. Mm. We do. And our fear of loss, like you talked, you touched, touched on grief, but if I have my business shut down on me, I want an explanation and I want, I want to know who to blame. And I want my business to be working again because I got to take care of my employees. Well, as a pastor, I want my church to be open again, right? I want to be able to hold services and see people and shake people's hands. But if you go back the chain, I have, uh, I have a governor of government that's giving guidelines and scripture like compels me to honor my government, to pray for my government, to respect my government. And then I have a whole medical profession that I respect because I believe they're seeking God's truth and general revelation and they're warning, they're giving a caution about this deadly virus. So those two principles of honoring the government and also of there's a threat that could bring 10, five to 10 funerals to my church if we continue to gather. I hear them both as real and trying to live that out though, I look for clarity and I want, I want to know exactly what's happened. So then I look to, I, and I'll be honest with you guys, I've tuned out a little bit. I've, I've been reading international news because I hear so much of that, what you just described, Tim, whenever, depending on the news that I read, is just everything. Even this virus is turning into a political tool in people's belts to try to get something. And I just get tired of it. Mm -hmm. And coming back around then, Andrew, I'm curious, what do you read for news? What do you recommend uh, people trust when it comes to news? I read the BBC. I don't know if that's mainstream, right, left, international. I know it's an international piece of news, but I, listen, I read different. I used to say read Fox and CNN and think for yourself, but I kind of changed that tune because I got tired of reading Fox and CNN. <laughs> uh, well, first, uh, something Tim said intrigued me talking about the attribution of, uh, and, and assuming things about people's motives. I, I have definitely seen that you know, if you're looking for bias, you're going to find it. So you're going to say, this is why this, this journalist framed it the way he did. Um, and there's nothing that journalist can do about it. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, I've seen this played out in my daily job. I'll take an article that I'll think, oh, here's a cool article or it's been two hours since we posted something to Facebook. I need something, here's one. I post it and immediately start seeing speculation from our readers about the dark motives of the news journal um, in posting this article. Well, the reality is um, nobody at the news journal except me knew that it was going to be posted and my motives were nothing like the ones they're describing, you know. Um, and that's not a defensiveness thing. That's just me knowing why I posted it and, and seeing these wild speculations. And, and I think uh, w when you start to fall into that, there is no news service that can be, you're not gonna find that news service. The only one that you're gonna find that you think is unbiased is the one that agrees with you because you're going to assume that their motives then are, are, are good. Um, mm. That being said, um, I think the BBC, is, it's interesting you mentioned that they have a little bit of a different standard than American journalism. They actually tend to be more con confrontational. Um, hmm. You know, and when I've listened to some of their um, world, world reports, I've heard them go after um, people in ways that American journalists would kind of be like, whoa, whoa, easy. Um, but, you know, I read the New York Times. Um, they do sometimes have a slant I've seen, um, but it's 
they also have a absolute commitment to accuracy and a long-standing tradition of that and just an absolute commitment to, to dig at the facts. And, and um, they're really the gold standard um, for journalism in the US. They've got the best journalists and uh, that's the, you know, that's, that's kind of the World Series, uh, the major leagues. Um, New York Times, you said? New York Times. Um, do, you have to, do you have to pay to read that online? Yes, ah, some of it. you can get a certain number per per month, but um, you know, contractually, I'm obligated to say USA Today Network, um, <laughs> which is what our paper is part of. Um, I do actually read a lot of those, um, mm -hmm. and I also love, I love NPR. Um, they just have such a commitment to fairness, and and you can tell that they're trying hard to do that. Um, you know, I think, I think, I, I, I don't like to use the word mainstream, but I'm trying to figure out a quicker way to say it. Most, I, I'm biased toward news, newspapers. I dislike cable news quite a bit. And it's not that cable news is making up news. It's that sandwiched in between, you have shouting people who are trying to get you to see that news a certain way and it's just ridiculous and um and also the 24-hour cycle you know when things get slow they just overhype because they have nothing else to talk about and it's not that there's an agenda where it's like i'm going to overhype this it's like it's a, it's four in the afternoon and this happened at 11 and nothing else has happened since so let's keep talking about it and and it can throw things out of perspective. Um, but I, I just really hate cable news. Um, not because of their reporting, but because of what all the garbage that's that reporting is sandwiched in. Um, I would take a newspaper any day of the week, any main city newspaper, you know, your, your LA Times, your Boston Globe, your Columbus Dispatch. Um, the culture there is very strong on finding the facts and and um and and if you mess up to come back and say hey we got it wrong so um you really look for facts and fairness and not sensationalism that's that's encouraging there because i just told a group of people i try to get my sources from people who are not yelling because mm -hmm. somebody yeah, and that's the thing a lot of people don't have the media literacy to distinguish between news which is the top of the hour coverage and that stuff in between. And they think it's all the same thing. Well, you know, if you look at, I've found when I read Fox News, um, the actual news articles, um, you know, there'll be some, some slant, but you know, they're, they're often slammed for being biased on the side of the right. Um, but, they're reporting essentially the same thing as the New York Times. It's that stuff in between where you have um, some rather opinionated people trying to tell you how, how to think about that news that, that throws people off. Mm. That, that's a good thought. And so thinking about those, the facts, fairness, and slant. And Tim, would it be wise for people to intentionally read something that challenges their biases? Is it possible for confirmation bias to be tweaked? Yeah, I think that I would, I would probably frame it just a little differently than that. I think it's important for people to know what their biases are. Mm. But if, if, you want, if you want to protect yourself from bias, you have to know what they, what they are. Um, and you have to have the assumption that you have them. Like many people just make the assumption they don't even have a bias that they just are simply, they just simply take the facts and they deal with the facts. Well, um, one of the areas of specialty in my work is marriage counseling. Uh, and one of the things that marital therapists are, um, are taught and are known to say often is I really don't care about finding the truth because we can fight all day about which one of your perspectives is the right one. The challenge becomes is, are you willing to listen to another person's perspective 
and advocate for your own and be able to be influenced by the other. Uh, and so as it relates to, as it relates to how we listen to information, it's really important that we, uh, that we understand that we have a bias and we should know what it is. Uh, and we should hold it with conviction and with humility and a willingness to change at the same time. And that's a, that's a sophisticated cognitive and psychologically complex process. Like that's hard work to say, yes, I have a bias or I have a conviction. This is what I believe. Here's why I believe it. And I'm going to stand on it while at the same time, I want to connect with you when you think differently than I do. And I want to be influenced by you because I know sometimes I can be stupid and I can sometimes think uh, I'm off base and I can be wrong. And so I'm willing to change because you've influenced me. Uh, and that attitude is in rare supply um, in our cultural conversations. Uh, but, but I think it's the way forward um, as, I, as I think about social science research, um, the, the one type of research is called qualitative um, analysis. And this is where researchers are not looking in at, at um, objective data, they're looking at subjective data and interpreting it. And so the whole point of that kind of research, like early in any writings is the authors are expected to um, very explicitly state their biases and why they've done this research, who's funding it, what's the motives behind it, because it's critically important for the reader to know the angle from which the research is being done. Um, I think that would be, um, that's, I think that's the way we should approach the news cycles and the opinion pieces that we hear from news cycles. Um, I think the, the frustration I have with cable news is the, that aspect of opinion and sensationalism is, is dumped right in with reporting. And it's so difficult to sort it out. And that's where all the psychological processes of confirmation bias and attribution um, and how we deal with our fears. I mean, it's like, if, you're, if you hate Trump, man, if he gets elected, the world is gonna go to hell in a handbasket. But boy, if a progressive gets elected, man, that that's the apocalypse, man, it's just right around the corner. Uh, and it's like, well, we need to know what our biases are and who we're listening to because it's gonna affect the way we listen. Uh, and many people don't have humility and don't have a willingness to hear other people out. Um, and yet at the same time advocate for what they think and believe. And um, it's a sad, I think it's a sad state of affairs relationally within our broader culture. This is so relevant to what's happening right now because um, I mean, as I sit here and I think like, what are my biases when I'm thinking about COVID-19 and the, what comes most to my mind is that uh, I have a father who's a physician and I have many friends who are physicians because I just got through medical school and they're all telling me what they're saying, what they're seeing, right? And so I, I view this as a really serious thing. And I've also tried to research as much as I can, read all these journals, tease out as much um, out of this, as I kind of said, poor data that we have, that still tells me this is a big deal. Um, but I've not lost my job. I'm, I'm starting residency in June and that's secure. And my wife is an artist who does videos online from, I'm in her wonderful studio right now, which is why I have this great lighting. Um, and, and so our, our livelihood is not threatened right now. So I have no strong reason to be really concerned about economy being shut down other than I can't do some fun things, right? But then I think there's, um, I was just reading a survey that it was dentists and doctors talking about how they felt about the shutdown right now. And it was like stark differences because a lot of these doctors still have jobs and are still doing okay, even though they are suffering, like I said. But the dentists, they are out, right? No, dentists, you can't be in someone's mouth right now. Who knows what you're going to get? And yeah, all these dentists who are like highly educated, you know, they would still fall into the 
categories of people who would be most likely to be progressive, et cetera, they want to restart the economy. They think we're overreacting, right? Because they have a reason to think that. I just think about what your situation is and there's going to be something going on and either you have a family member who's had COVID, so you think one way, or your, your livelihood is at stake and so you think another way. That makes sense. Now I think you know your bias, right? Now hold that and then watch and see if maybe you are being influenced too far by your bias and try to see the other side, I think is the advice that I, I am trying to live by myself. That was very well said. I like that. Uh, I think that's a great, a great model for people to very actively understand kind of the biases from which they're coming. Mm-hmm. Thanks for, thanks for capturing that so succinctly. Mm-hmm. And my bias is I want to have church again. <laughs> and I want it to be, I want it to be safe. And I think of the stages of grief, like personally, I felt like this denial almost like, yeah, hey, we're going to keep things as normal as possible. Lots of Zoom meetings. This will be great. And then two or three weeks in, I'm so tired of Zoom meetings. I gave <laughs> myself a break this past week. And now it's like kind of that wondering May 1st, or is it Monday? I think governor, our governor is supposed to give an update. And as a church, we're talking like, how are we going to, if we can get back together, how are we going to do that in a way that is safe and everybody feels comfortable? And if it's under 50 at first, what does that look like? There's just a lot of unknowns. And I think, I think though, the truth about COVID-19 is that it's an opportunity for us as people to like realize some of this stuff you're talking about. This is where I'm coming from, but this is impacting you. I'm seeing people on my street I've never seen before walking and running. I didn't even know they lived there. It's because <laughs> we're we're all having a shared experience, which is traumatic. But it's COVID-19. There isn't anybody out there who's not living through it. And I do see gestures of compassion that are encouraging. I think it's an opportunity, especially for the church, for us to be compassionate. But I do see real problems, like our food pantries donations are tanking like down $8,000 a month, whenever you need it, food pantry, right? Andrew, when you need journalists to cover the news and be fair and give facts, and when you need a dentist, I imagine there's people who still need dentists. All of us are experiencing this shutdown that's negatively affecting the economics and we're realizing what all our business people do, like they fund our food pantry, they they fund our churches, they fund our, our, our newspaper industry and, we're all hurting. So I think it's an opportunity for compassion, but I'd love to give that as a closeout for you guys. What do you think the truth is about COVID-19? That's why people have joined our conversation tonight. They, they want to know what's the truth about COVID-19. What would you say from your perspective? I'd love to just, I was hoping to, to actually compare it to the flu uh, since everyone wants to do that. Um, Because I think, I think it's important to have a good grasp on some of these numbers as this data will become more solid and and you'll start to see more reporting on what the fatality rate of this virus is. Um, I I just want you to remind you that regardless of the infection rate of this virus, that matters. The fatality rate matters, um, how many people die who have it, but also how many people get it matters, right? Those, Those are the two factors. So in 2018-19 season, flu season, so that's August to April, nine months, in the U.S., we had 35 million cases of flu, 34,000 deaths, right? So a tenth of the U.S. population got the flu because there's about 350 um, because half of us were vaccinated and many have passive immunity from previous exposure. And then the, the infection fatality rate was 0.1%. So COVID-19 in 2020, March and April, just two months, we have a million cases, but we know that's not true. It might be as many as 15 million cases right now. We have 50,000 deaths at least so far. So that's already more in two months. And if we go about life as usual, there's no reason to believe that less than 60% of our adult population will get this throughout this year sometime. And that's really the number that we need for passive immunity. Another term you're gonna hear a lot is like 50 or 60% of the population has to get it before the the transmission rates go down low enough to say, oh, we're kind of covering each other. If 
if we you take the adult population of the US, that's 250 million people. And if we take 60% of them, that's 150 million. So even if we give COVID the exact same fatality rate as the flu, 0.1%, and if, if 150 million infections occur, um, that's 152,000 deaths, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we'd be looking at throughout a whole year. So that still is going to be five times as many as the flu killed, right? If that, if that fatality rate climbs just a little to 0.3%, our COVID deaths are gonna exceed 450,000. That's a lot of people, right? That's gonna have a big impact. And this fall, the flu is gonna be here as well. And we'll have them together at the same time, very likely. And then we'll be worried about our healthcare systems being overflowed again. We'll, we'll put beds in the convention center all over again. So even if a, a lot of the things you've been hearing about COVID are exaggerated, the data we do have still says this is a big deal. Yeah. We might not kill millions. And I desperately hope that millions don't die, right? There still is going to be reason this fall for you, Preston, to be trying to figure out what to do at Shiloh. And I still think we're going to have limits on how many people can meet for a very long time until we have a vaccine. So that's, I don't want to leave that. Like there is some certainty that this still is a bad thing and it's worse than the flu. It's worse than a lot of other things that we've experienced. Yeah. yeah I think that leads me like in how I would summarize and close um, as it relates to truth about COVID uh, lead me back to um, what have been called the five principles of resiliency is that we are going through as a culture, as individuals, as families, like a really, really difficult and challenging um, point in time. And, um, and so one researcher was looking at what he called the five principles of, of resiliency. Um, and those, those started with, we commit to a purpose in life. We have to, um, we have to find a sense of, of what am I here for? Um, and so for people who are here for the purpose of making money, dang, I'm not going to be particularly resilient right now because it's going to be costing me money. Um, but so we have to find a really meaningful and deep purpose around which we're going to orient our lives. Um, once we have done that, we want to take a step towards it. Like we want to, how do I, how do I lean in to that sense of purpose? Um, and as I do that, it is going to require me, the third step is to move into the unpleasant circumstances of life. Um, people by, by nature tend to avoid unpleasant circumstances. They tend to be afraid of them and tend to anxiety in particular is about avoidance and pulling away from what scares us. Um, if we want to overcome our anxieties, we move into them and we move through them. Um, and then fourth is an aspect of mindfulness. It's a place of being aware in the present moment, not being judgmental, um, being present with God, with ourselves, with other people. Um, and then we take ownership and responsibility for our lives. Like we have to be, um, we have to continue um, to take ownership of the outcomes that we receive. Um, and all of us are responsible for our reactions, for our, the ways we cope. Um, the ways we deal with the challenges that are in front of us. Uh, and so um, from a mental health perspective, the truth of COVID-19 is that it's a, it's a real phenomenon. Even if we find out that medically, we just completely missed it. Uh, I, from a mental health perspective, this has had a catastrophic impact. Um, it is going to continue to have an impact um, and we need to we need to serious, it's a great opportunity. Um, crisis provides an opportunity for us to go in a different direction. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to reorganize our priorities and um, connect with the people that we love um, and, and learn about ourselves um, through it all. So thanks Preston for organizing this time. Thanks Tim. And Make sure to check out Tim's YouTube channel if you're watching, because he goes into a lot more depth on principles of resiliency. Oh yes, thank you. Which is one that I, which is one that I played back and I shared with some friends. Is a those those concepts are very helpful for me personally. Yes. Yeah, my Andrew, YouTube channel is 
My, my YouTube channel is um, titled Mind If I Speak. Mind If I Speak. And after that, check out Dorvin's wife's channel. <laughs> mm -hmm. what's, what's Miranda's? Mira Byler, M-I-R-A-B-Y-L-E-R. -E it's totally not related, but kids will love it, right? Okay. She does really nice art stuff yeah. <laughs> and hangs out with you while you watch. And make sure you read Andrew's column in USA Today whenever that comes out again. Andrew, you just heard two, a doctor and a counselor talk. So why don't you give us the facts fairly, what they just said, <laughs> and make your closing statement. What's the truth about COVID-19? Well, there's a cliche about journalism that it's the first draft of history. And I think that's kind of where we find ourselves now. We, we've talked about this from a lot of different angles, but there's just a ton of uncertainty and we're trying to figure it out. And, you know, we, we don't quite know yet. And, and so I think we need to have grace for each other um, as we try to do this. You know, it took me a little bit to get on board and be convinced that this was as big of a deal as it is because um, I was comparing it with the flu and um, making some erroneous comparisons there. And, and as I saw both how it affected people, um, both physically as they ended up in the hospital in places like Italy and New York City, um, and then also just the huge impact of the economic um, things. This is a huge deal. Um, and, you know, are we overreacting or underreacting? We're gonna look back in a, a year or so and we're gonna have all the answers and it's gonna seem like it was inevitable and that we should have known while we were in it. But that's just not true. I would. Um, I'd like to read a quote from an author named Philip Roth. I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but in one of his novels, um, it's a historical novel, and he's, he's dealing with a very turbulent time in this novel, and he's talking about the unforeseen, and he says, the unfolding of the unforeseen was everything. Turned wrong way round, the relentless unforeseen was what we school children study as history, harmless history, where everything unexpected in its own time is chronicled on the page as inevitable. The terror of the unforeseen is what the science of history hides, turning a disaster into an epic. And so right now we're in the middle of this and um, we don't know how to react. Um, so definitely some grace for each other as we're, as we're trying to figure it out. Thank you, Andrew. Well said. That is a great ending to our time together. It's been great hanging out with you guys. And thanks to everybody who joined us live. I do have one question for Dr. Byler. My brother's planning to get married in August. And he's saying, so Dr. Byler's saying no wedding in August? I think he, there's a good chance that gatherings under 50 people may be going on by August but I really doubt there will be anything. There's not gonna be sporting events for a long time, right? And, and, and perhaps some churches will be meeting um, that are a little smaller, but yeah, it, your wedding can happen. You just gotta curate that list a little more. Okay. Most of the people, uh, you won't even remember they were there, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> just pick the ones you really like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that, that you can have as large of a wedding as you like, but I am skeptical. Yeah, yeah. That's a, in my head, that's a worst case scenario, but mm. this has been helpful for me just to hear each of you talk and in a way it's making me settle back into, I need to go back and watch Tim's YouTube video again about resilience because this is going to be, the truth is this is not going to be over tomorrow. It's not going to be mm -hmm. over Monday, and I keep waiting for that moment when the governor says, okay, you can get back to life as usual, and we just don't know. So in that uncertainty, we turn to God, and we lean on each other, and mm -hmm. I appreciate each one of you as friends, and thank you for taking the time to be here, and thanks to everybody who joined us live. Appreciate your interaction and sharing and commenting as well. Well, that wraps it up for today. Thanks for joining this episode of Mind If I Speak. As always, leave your comments below and share with your friends and subscribe to this channel. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.